I'm Cindy Abbott Lutro for Behind the Camera, and today we're going to be talking about a film that it's been a number of years, but I remember hearing about it when it was being shot in Buffalo, and that is Bashira. And Nixon Fong, the director, is with us, and Leah Macon, who is star of, of the film, also with us. And, and I welcome you, Belle. Nixon, you know, I have to, it's, it's in your Wikipedia. You're the only person from Singapore that's ever won an Academy Award. Um, your background is one in which you came up with something that really revolutionized film called a post space deformation. Now you gotta just you gotta really quickly tell me what that's all about. It's a very geeky thing. It's a geeky thing. <clears throat> it's a very geeky thing that you know you you do with a bunch of friends in a garage, coding <laughs> away, not knowing like what it's. But really you got do. an Academy Award for it. Yeah, it was a bit of a shock when we found out about it and um, we, we thought we, we got a we actually got a, a email from the Academy and we thought I thought it was a spam I should delete it but it, <laughs> it, it's something that has allowed films like spider-man right. avatar to be made it, it could have been geeky but it was something mm. that yeah, hadn't been so, used before so let me explain how it works mm -hmm. it's um it's a muscle system for digital characters so a lot of there are a lot of problematic areas for animated, char animated characters, especially in the shoulder areas and your facial deformation. So it allows the artist to sculpt the facial or the muscle to look exactly what the artist want. And then it interpolates, meaning that it transforms the different poses. So a lot of films use it like, um, I would say like a lot of the blockbuster films that you see like Avatar, um, Spider-Man, <clears throat> It, it, it's like very that. cool, and I hmm. can see how, you know, but it's funny because, as you said, it's something that, at the time, you just thought, you know, it was a, a geeky thing to do. Right. Um, <laughs> Liam, as a young actor, I was reading, you started very young in all kinds of things. That's right. You know, the way that film is today, and particularly in Bashir, explain to me what, what, you, what your character is. Well, um, uh, I play a young guy who's a DJ, and um, he's more into the musical production side of things. So um, something, you know, that uh, a lot of people have some experience with. And yeah, he's, um, he's, he's kind of, in a way, he is, he is the, the person that we're, we're, as the audience, we're finding out about the plot of this film through him. But in a way, he's kind of an outsider. Um, this this uh, the story comes to him, and he's he's not sure what's happening in his world, and he's trying to to understand. Well, I was just going to get back to to Nixon here because the Bashira has been described as a hallucinogenic nightmare. <laughs> right. It's kind of that's kind of a scary description. It is a scary description because um, Bashira has no form. There's no name for this thing. It, it, they just so call Bashira it is a thing? It's an entity. Okay. A lot of Japanese people, um, they have many names, so like ghost, spirit, and if there's something they can describe what it is, they just call it an entity. It's an it. Um, so, and Bashira comes with a, a very powerful curse that nobody knows what it's really about. And when you hear it, it puts you in this space that you hallucinate and you do something to yourself. And is that where you come in? Does this mm. cause hallucinations? Yes, yes. Um, you know, terrifying visions, um, you know, worst nightmare kind of things um, begin happening. and. Not sure if it's real or, yeah, it's, it's that. So how do you find, you know, when, when I've talked to different actors, you know, they sort of find the core of how they approach this. This sounds like it's almost ethereal, like there's this something out there that's going on. I mean, how, how do you connect? Right. Um, I think you start with the reality of the person you are portraying. So all the things that made up, um, we, we went with the DJ named DJ Rovi. Um, but his name is Andy, uh, mostly in the film. And uh, you know what what make up his his life? What are the things that are important to him? And then, as this unknown thing comes after him, the threat of losing those things is what is the most important concern. That's the that's the center. So even though I don't 
Yeah, even though this is a completely foreign concept, and and a lot of the the concepts you know the, the, that that we we talked about were were fairly deep and, and compl complex, you can't really play all of that. So you kind of have to look at um, what are the real stakes, what are the what are the stakes in the moment, uh, what does this mean for me? Uh. This is not a conventional film, as you know, like oh. uh, as people would, you know, go to the movies. I mean, it it has. I think a distinct audience, and and who do you see, you know, this appealing to? I, I think it appeals to people. Um, I sit across many demographics. Okay. Um, people who like cult classic. There are people, you know, the younger generation who are into electronic music, especially, and then there are people who like sort of the East mix with the West, kind of Japanese western type storyline um, and there's all these different moments for everybody like there is music there is like rapping there is kind of like a music video even and then there's action there is a big epic moments so it's kind of a, a story that goes across many different genres that appeals to quite a number of people and if I may, yeah, the, there was one thing I was thinking about, which is that there's an aspect to it too. Um, it's it's this modern kind of horror, but it's also kind of a classic monster movie too, in a way, because even though this thing comes in many different forms, you know it's one thing that's coming, and that that eventually, you know, that's that's what you're looking for. It's this right. it's this right. monster. It's, it's like this suspense hmm. that's always there. Hmm. That. There's this something, an other that that that's looming in in the outside. Surreal. Uh -huh. I would say like suspense and surreal, and then like there is action hmm. and lots of um, monster moments. Hmm. How do you two interact? I mean, when you're the director and you're the actor, and you know what I, I would assume you have a vision of, of what you want to see. How do you convey that? Would you wanna? You, you wanna go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, uh, you know, I think I think we we kind of start by just feeling. So so I'll you know we'll we'll be working and feeling things out, and then and then we come to a, a meeting point. You know, if 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 that needs to move, if where it is needs to move, then we'll talk about that. And we we talked about um, you know different levels too, like you know tr just trying to play with some of the dynamics of of cause, because my character is unsuspecting for so long. Um, you know, at what point does that start to creep in? So we, yeah, we talked about the charting that um, part of the story. This was started in 2018 and just was completed. So it took a while to get this movie finished. How come? Well, it was mainly because of COVID. Okay. Yeah, um, we had a really rough time with COVID. Um, I was at the time uh, early, just, just six months before COVID. Uh, I remember I was editing in LA and I said, let's go to Bangkok and do the post so we save a lot of money. And then six months later, boom, everything was locked down. Oh, uh, when all the work that we sent out to visual effects company, some of the companies, they went bankrupt. You know, they went disfunct, like they completely laid off all their staff and we have to collect all these data back from them and start from scratch. So we lost at least a year and a half, sure. maybe two years even. And it was a very, very difficult time. You know, it, it's interesting because you hear how COVID in so many different ways affected everything. I mean, it, performers, uh, it, from the creative standpoint, you don't realize that so much of the post-production yeah. can be done overseas. So are, are you happy? I mean. It took a long time to get this completed, but are you happy with the way the product has finished? I, I couldn't be happier um, because I had a lot of time to think about the film <laughs> while we were trying to find you know, a visual effects company to finish it. Um, and I actually jumped into editing a film myself because you know it was a lockdown and nobody else could do it. So I had to do it. And um, I learned so much. And, Actually, COVID was a blessing in disguise for, for me, especially I got quite a lot of experience just taking a film from, you know, from start to finish. I think it was 
quite an experience. Nixon, uh, when you come to a town like Buffalo, of course, there's, uh, you know, you have in your vision of what the different locations are going to be. So you have to make the locations in Buffalo look like, I mean, where did you shoot? What did you, you know, what were some of the areas that you, that you shot? Wow. Um, coming to Buffalo was really an eye-opener. I mean, I could have been to a better place. And I was, I, I had this dilapidated sort of like, you know, horror film, you need to have this very grimy, gritty, gritty urban realism. Urban realism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so hmm. Buffalo was just perfect for that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was so happy. I was, you know, uh, Tim and uh, Rich, you know, showed me around and showed me all the locations. And in like one of the locations, I remember a uh, Statler building. Yes. It was so amazing. Like, we didn't have to do any set dressing, you know. Isn't that great? Yeah, it, it would save a lot of money, you know. <laughs> um, so it was it was great. I mean, there are so many locations. Well, and I know that you also shot at WNED, yes. which is our public station here. You actually were able, because it does have a certified sound stage in it, right. so you were able to set up there. Right, which is great. Um, our offices, I think, were just right, right above it, mm -hmm. like our pre-production right. office. Yeah, and it was very handy, um, and I remember the crew was very helpful. Uh, I think we shot, I think maybe two or three days, something like that, mm -hmm. and the sets were all built there. Um, it, and it where were they supposed to be? I mean, what was it supposed to be? What was it in a different country or? It was supposed to be this dream nightmare sequence okay. of Layla. She plunged into this hallucinogenic nightmare and she can't get out and she was trapped and this was like um, the moment when she was invoked by the spirit or by the entity. Oh. And she was doing some weird uh, movements, like dance movements. Um, obviously, nobody knows what it is, but she's actually writing out the curse song. Yeah. That's so it's the, the, very that is, Yes. <laughs> That, right. that, that is sort of psychedelic and a little creepy, but uh, now, Liam, and you did, mm. as I understand, a lot of things in front of green screen, and, and I think that a lot of people have, have seen green screens used before so that you actually can be anywhere or anything. That's right. What's that like? Well, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I've been talking to tennis balls for 20 years. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, the first film that I, I, I had green screen work and I, I was um, a film called Good Boy. I was 12 years old and I was speaking to about six or seven dogs, you know, so that were speaking back to me. Um, so I've, I've had a lot of experience over the years in different scenarios um, and I really enjoy it because it's, it becomes a game of imagination and, and what's, you know, what's inside your head and, and you're telling the story. I often fall in love with the version of the story that I that I see in my head when I read the script, so it's kind of a way to take that out and 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 just play with it in a totally free space. For those people that don't know what a green screen is, what does that? Can you explain that really? Sure. It's it it's um it's a green background like you've seen, but the way it works is basically it's just such a different color. It's such a contrast that that you can have a computer. Um, turn, remove the green and replace it or, or overlay the green with, with something else. So, so you can have, you know, we could be anywhere right now. No. So the experience was a good one when you were in Buffalo? It, it, it was awesome. I, I really loved it. And I loved it so much that, you know, sometimes I wish I can come back here. It's like home, you know. I you spent can come back. almost. We'll let you come back. <laughs> yeah, I almost spent almost like, it's got to be at least like four months or maybe five months. And towards the tail end, I just had so little time because I had to move everything back to LA. And I wish I had a little bit more time to just look around and explore Buffalo. But again, you know. We're in the film business. That, we that is what the go. film business is about. Well, we are delighted that you spent the time that you spent in Buffalo and that you have a finished product with Shira. Thank you so much. That's out and that you had a good experience. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you. Me. Thank you thank so you. much, Cindy. Thank, thank you. you for being with us. And I hope you'll be with us next month of Behind the Camera. And definitely thank the Film Commission for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Thank you.